Hi everyone, welcome to Skill-Based Art, a learning resource for art students and artist teachers. My name is Andrew Bono, and today I'll be demonstrating uh, how to do a drawing on toned paper from a plaster cast. There are many reasons why art students from the Renaissance up until today have uh, learned to draw from plaster casts. One of the reasons is that it doesn't move, unlike a life model. Um, so you really uh, can spend the time getting the drawing correct, um, seeing proportions, seeing where the lines and angles meet, um, getting the shapes right. Another reason is that uh, it's it one colour rather than um, you know the, the multiple variations of colour that we see in nature. You're not dealing with changes in local colour, you're dealing with only the different shades that occur um, on the white object. Uh, when we have an artificial light situation like we have here, you have very clear shadow shapes and very clear areas of light which makes it easy for the art student to differentiate between the two and, and learn to understand uh, why those things are occurring. And another reason, which is actually a very important one, uh, in, in Western uh, drawing and painting there's a tradition that goes back to the ancient Greeks. And so a lot of the plaster casts that students would learn from are actually uh, casts from uh, Greek or Roman sculpture. So not only are you learning to draw what you see, but you're also learning a certain kind of aesthetic that has been inherited and gets passed down through the generations. This is not a uh, Greek or Roman sculpture, this is actually a 17th century sculpture by Bernini, uh, but it's, it's within that same tradition. It's, he, would, he has studied the uh, ancient Greeks and the ancient Roman sculpture and added his own flavour to that and then by drawing it we can imbibe some of that hopefully. So I'll be working on toned paper uh, rather than white and uh, one of the reasons is that uh, you get a result quicker. Uh, the toned paper is a mid-tone, and so you add the light and you add the dark, but you don't have to put in the labour to actually fill in the mid-tone. Whereas on white, you need to actually do a lot more work. It takes longer. It's good to practice both, because you want to have mastery of actually creating a, a scale of tone, but the toned paper is really useful. So uh, I'll spend a lot of the time uh, doing what's called a block-in, which is a linear, a linear drawing. Uh, then I'll define the shadow shapes, I'll fill in the shadows, and then I'll spend a bit of time what we call modelling, which is analysing the light, uh, using the white chalk, adding that for the light areas, and the gradation going into shadow using the graphite and having the tone paper in the middle so we can create the illusion of volume. So without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so um, whenever I start a drawing, I always want to see what the highest and lowest points are and then establish them on the paper. Uh, this cast is more vertical than it is, it's taller than it is wider, so I want to establish the top and bottom. Uh, if you've got a cast or, or a model or whatever it is that's horizontal, uh, you go side to side because that's your bigger measurement. So whatever the, whatever the bigger measurement is, you want to establish that on your page first. Uh, from there, all the other proportions are derived. From there, you can find your halfway point, you can find your quarters, you can find a height to width comparison, and everything will flow from that. Uh, but if you haven't established uh, those initial two points, uh, then you're always you're always chasing the proportions, you're always chasing the drawing, and you'll you'll just um, uh, it will lead to frustration. Uh, so I don't know that from experience. So I think it's a really useful uh, way to start. Okay, so uh, I'm just gonna. So this, in a very loose way, um, I'm using an HB pencil, uh, I, it's kind of nice, it's not too soft, it's not too hard, it's just sort of in the middle, uh, very useful I think for drawing. Okay, so top and bottom, um, and that, that th those points represent the top of the head and uh, the bottom of the, the actual cast at the lowest point, which from my view is here. Okay, so from there, uh, I'm going to just start establishing uh, a big shape, okay? Some people call this the, the envelope. Uh, you know, it's, it's basically the biggest uh, simplified version of what, of what this cast is uh, that, you can, that you can draw with as few lines as possible. Now you'll notice I'm, I'm holding up my pencil like this. Uh, I'm, I'm basically looking at the angle of, of the edge of it and I'm seeing if I'm getting the same angle. I'm not being too strict about um, every little angle, I'm just treating it in, a, in quite a broad way at the moment. 
So I'm trying to estimate the width. If that's the that's the corner of the hair, that's the edge of the shoulder, then this probably comes in here. Um, the chin, I imagine, would be around here. Because I'm pressing lightly, I can make changes. I can rub all this out if it's wrong. I'm not committing to anything yet, except the top and bottom. The rest of it is, uh, you know, free to, to move around and change, so, so that's fine. Now, looking for the bottom of the hair over that side. And now I've got an enclosed shape, okay? Bottom here. Now, if this is my lowest point right here, uh, which is equivalent to that, if I, I can see that it actually rises up on an angle. So I want to establish that angle. And then it sort of rises up again that way. I'm looking at this shape. I think it can get more narrow if it comes in. So yeah, that initial width was um, probably too wide. This can move up a bit. So I'm not, I'm not really adding more detail. I'm just moving around the, the parts that are already there, the lines that are already there. That can come in there. Changing that angle to that making it thinner, making the angle more steep. So it, as, as well as um, the initial measurement between top and bottom, I'm now looking at angles, okay? Or I'd say tilts, like the, the, the tilt of that line, the tilt of that line, the tilt of that line. Uh, when two lines meet, they create an angle, okay? And you can, you can sort of look at that angle on her, um, the edge of the shoulder and see if it's the same. What I might also try and establish is, in a very simple way, the separation of light on the face. So you've got light here and shadow here, and that shadow shape gets cast onto the neck, so I can also treat that as, um, treat that as one shape. It continues up here as well. Now, um, in a very uh, simplified way, I'm just going to very lightly fill that in so that I can see that it's shadow. And I'm now comparing, I'm trying to find this, I think that's still too high, so. This looks a bit better. And I'm just looking back and forth, looking back and forth, looking back and forth continually. I'm trusting. I'm trusting my eyes to a large degree. Uh, later on in the process, I will, I'll do a lot of measuring and things like that. But for the time being, I'm, um, I'm just comparing visually. Okay, so this cuts across here. Now, um, something that was very useful for me when I learned this method was, uh, was process. So, establish a top and bottom. Within the first five minutes, find the halfway point. Okay, so it's probably been about five minutes. And so I'm going to um, figure out where the halfway point is. From, so halfway between here and here. Now what I'm doing is holding out my, uh, my right arm, I'm closing my left eye, and my right eye is open, so it's looking straight through like this, holding up my pencil. And what you need to do is you've got to guess where the halfway point is, and then you check if your guess was correct or not. So I'm going to... I'll probably be totally wrong, but I'm, I'm going to guess that it's here at the bottom of that shadow. Now I'll check. So how you check, you hold your pencil out, as I said, uh, straight up like that. One eye closed. Now the tip of the pencil lines up with the point that I think is halfway. And now my thumb is in line with the bottom of the cast. Okay, so that that is lined up with that measurement. And so what I do now is move my hand up. I was way off, that's embarrassing. We'll have to edit that out. Okay, so <laughs> when I doubled that up, I took this measurement, I doubled it up, it actually got me above the head, which, is, um, which, which means that I guessed too high. 
So maybe it's uh, the bottom of the chin. Maybe, maybe it's uh, here. Okay, so I'll do that. I'm doing the same thing. Tip of the pencil is at the bottom of the chin. Uh, thumb is at the bottom of the cast. Double that up. What do you know? That's pretty close. Okay, let's see. Yeah, that's very that's useful. Good. It's nice when that happens. When when the halfway point falls on a particular point, it's useful because sometimes it falls on a a big open area and you you know it's hard to hard to find it again. But it actually um, it actually joins up right here where the um, where the neck and the chin overlap. Okay. So so that's what happens on her in the cast. Now I have to make sure that's happening in my drawing. Okay. So let me see if that's actually half. Double that up. No, that's too low. So maybe it's here. And then I'll I'll get rid of that because I don't need that mark. Uh, is it this? Double that up. No, that's still too low. Bring it up again, just incrementally, because you know it, it'll double that as you as you bring it up. So bring that up even a little bit more. Maybe here. That's pretty good. Okay, so I've got a halfway point now. What does that mean? That means I know where the chin has to go. I don't know where it has to go side to side, but at least I know where it goes top to bottom. And I've got I've got this established and this, and I've I've got a general idea about the widths and the angles. So I can start I can start drawing the chin and start um, drawing the you know the outline of the face. So the neck is going down here. This. Interesting, this actually does have to come up a bit higher. I brought it down before, but I guess I was wrong. Okay. Now, another thing you should do at this point is compare compare a height to a width. So what we can do is um, take this measurement and compare it to a width somewhere in the drawing. See what, what it's equal to. So you, um, again, put your thumb lined up with the bottom of the cast. And the tip of the pencil lined up with uh, that halfway point, which is which is here, as I established before. And then what you do, you turn your hand that way, and see, just, just keep moving it around and see if it lines up with any two points. It doesn't it doesn't really line up exactly with anything, but it lines up with. Let me see. From here to just to the left of this shadow, that distance is equal to the half. Okay, so that's that's useful. I can find this half. I'll call this fixed. You've got to trust something, so I'll trust that. And then I'll draw this draw this shadow in because that point was just to the left of that shadow. And I'll measure it again. Yeah, so the shadow's going to be around here. And I know I know that the height of the chin is going to be there. Now, if the shadow's here, that means that that's too wide. Bring this in. So that that negative space is um, more accurate. And then I'm going to follow that the sort of um, drapery up like this. Shave off a little bit there, and that means that the neck will move to the right because I need room for this space here. Okay. So things shift around, but not everything shifts around. There are certain points that don't. Bottom, top, halfway point, and now this and this. So we have one, two, three, four, five things that we can trust. They're not going to move. Uh, and we can use them to derive other other points. Okay, so this is here. I'll start establishing where the separation of the drapery and the skin is. And then maybe get a bit more accurate shadow shape. And I'm trying to find the point here, where the you know where the collar is. 
And I'm taking a vertical line from that point straight up and seeing what it lines up with. And it's just to the right of this little shadow, so it's basically here. See that? It's, a, it's called a plumb line. You can take a vertical line and, you know, that lines up with this, just to the right. Okay, now I can join, join these things together. Do this. Okay. Now I'm drawing this uh, cast quite a bit smaller than the actual cast is, but it doesn't really matter what size you draw it because you're basically um, uh, drawing it in, pro in the same proportion that this is. It doesn't have to be the same size, it's a proportion. And the proportion is established by the size that you made it on the paper, top and bottom. That establishes your proportion. I could have drawn an actual size if I wanted to, um, but I preferred to draw it a bit smaller. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a good method because you, it means you can draw things at any at any scale. Okay, seems pretty good. So now I'll start establishing um, what the features are in a very simplified way. This is fixed. Uh, let me see, that's going to be... Yeah, okay. I'm looking for the highest point on the top of the head, which is just in the middle here, and then it tapers down on either side from there, but I'm still keeping this where it is, where it was at the beginning. I think I can um, <clears throat> bring that in a little bit. The chin is a fixed point, um, and then from the chin I can kind of look at where the bottom of that clump of hair will be, probably about here. Know where this is. Okay, then the neck I think can um, push in a little bit. Okay. Now, um, looking at this point, um, I know that it's halfway between here and here, and I also have a pretty good idea of where it is side to side because this is an established point. I can probably move just to the right of that line. See how the lines were thick and now I'm just pushing against, pushing from one side to make the line thinner and more precise. I don't start off with thin lines. They're, they're a result of pushing shapes around and pushing angles around. That doesn't mean you can't start drawing with thin lines. You, you know, it's, it's also a nice way to draw, but um, this is a this is a good way to learn to draw, and it also means you don't have to get it right the first time. You can you can find you can find the line. Okay. Now what I'll do is um, find out the quarter. So halfway between here and here. I'm just going to have a look. Um, it's on a portrait. It's usually um, usually right here. It's called the tear duct. Uh, that's not the correct term for it, it's not a medical term, because the tears, I think, actually come from that, this side, but anyway, I'll just call it that. So I'm going to measure from, again, from the chin um, to that point, uh, and then double it up and see if it gets me. I have a feeling that it isn't because uh, I'm kind of looking down on her a little bit, so I'm going to guess that it mm, that it's sort of the, the middle of the eye, kind of in the middle of the pupil. So from the bottom of the chin, lining up my thumb there, and then the top of the pencil lines up with the middle of the eye. And then just moving my hand, moving my arm up. It's still way too low. So um, it's partly the angle of the head, and partly she's got sort of, you know, uh, quite puffy hair at the top, which may, means the halfway point will be higher, because we're going all the way to the top of the hair. So I would uh, probably guess it's, it's going to be here, maybe. I'll try that. Double that up. Mm, almost. Let's try this point here, which is uh, just between the eye and the eyebrow. Okay, maybe it's the eyebrow. It's too high. Okay, it's uh, somewhere in between. Okay, got it. It's um, 
just at the bottom of the uh, the sort of bottom of the shadow, which which runs across the eyebrow. So what we can do is find that point on here. It's the quarter, half of the half, which is here. Okay, yep. Yeah, so halfway between these two is this, and uh, that's the eyebrow. Okay. Now relating the eyebrow to all these other points that we've got seems about right. Um, the nose wants to run through here. You've got a shadow shape like a triangular, a triangular shadow shape here, and then I can get rid of these uh, these sort of guess marks that I had before because I, I can I don't need them anymore. But I know they're not they're not accurate. So we can start establishing um, the shadow under the eye. I'm just darkening the shadow a little bit more. And looking at this light shape, there's a kind of pointy quality to it, like a like a shark's fin. So I want to get that in my drawing. And then I can try to be a bit more specific about that shape as well, like this. Okay, so I feel like I feel pretty confident about where this is. From there, I can extrapolate out, start getting the shape of the nose. This is the chin, then I've got the bottom of the lip, shadow there, um, the top lip, bottom of the nose will be somewhere here. Then I've got a shadow underneath the nose as well. So you can see that um, even though this is basically a cast of someone's head, um, I didn't go for the features straight away. Uh, I had, I, I'm drawing the whole thing, so I need to take the whole thing into account, uh, and, and you know that that can take time. So I'm just taking a vertical line from the side of the hair on this side to it. From this angle, it lines up basically perfectly with this. So if I take a vertical line straight up, I'm going to be doing that. So I'm, I'm cutting off a significant amount. Basically, I had this thing way too wide. Uh, at the beginning. Okay, so I'll just establish this, find that point again, and look at how, look at the steep angle it comes down. It tucks in a little bit. Shape of the forehead can be indicated um, slightly. And then you know we're looking for the other the other triangle of shadow on that side. And now looking at um, this point here where the hair um, stops, pretty much in line with the bottom of the nose. Now I don't know if the bottom of the nose is exactly correct, but it's pretty close, so I can I can just put that in. And that's a good start. Okay, so what I'm doing now is actually um, using a mirror to um, see the drawing and the cast both in the mirror but re reversed. Uh, it's a really useful tool. It's, it's the second best thing to having someone come over who knows how to draw and look at your drawing uh, objectively. Um, the mirror gives you an objective view um, and it shows you just any major any major mistakes that you may be making like an angle might be wrong which you haven't picked up on or something might be too big that you haven't picked up on so uh, I'm just gonna do that for a little bit and make some comparisons so yeah the one of the things I'm noticing is mm, Probably this this side here needs needs um, it needs more definition. It lo it looks just very thin. Um, when I look at this, it's thinner here than it gets wider. Uh, and also, I feel like uh, the side of the face can actually come in a little bit. So I will do that, which will give me more room here. So.
bring that in slightly and now that seemed pretty good um, bringing it in you'll remember that I measured this point um, to be kind of uh, I couldn't go further left than this what I might do is take another measurement of um, I'll compare a I might compare a quarter and see what that lines up with. remember I've got the top and bottom bottom and top I've got the halfway point which is here, I've got the quarter which is here and so uh, what I can do is take this measurement and see what, what that's if that lines up with a quarter or something like that so I'll take the quarter measurement um, from the eyebrow to the top of the head and then I'm going to turn my pencil this way and then see what okay so that distance is basically equal to from the beginning of the hair here to the beginning of the hair on this side. Now I want to be a bit more specific so I'll measure that again. Yeah, so probably here and that means that the, the, the forehead can move in a bit. Now I'm going to compare the actual width, sorry the actual quarter yeah okay just as I suspected I needed more room here and I was able to push that across to make the forehead narrower to make that the quarter equal to the quarter and it also gave me more room here so um, if your drawing is working in when you're measuring things and changing things you usually solve more than one problem at a time because if it's if it's right it's right for me you know for many reasons okay I can probably push that across a little bit um, like this. I'm going to um, use the eraser to just shave off a little bit of that shape and then bring the nose a little bit more to the right. Uh, this is generally trustworthy. It's not totally right, but I think it's pretty much in the right place. And then I can go across and draw the other side it's at a slight angle it's it's not exactly horizontal it's a bit like that so I'll do that okay so then I'm looking through the bottom of the lower lid and then making a bit more space here for the actual eye um, you know the eyeball and the pupil or iris to fit uh, this is a fixed point, as we established before, because it's the quarter between here and here, or the, the quarter of the total, it's uh, halfway between here and here. So that's fixed, and now I can make that angle a little bit more steep, and then pick it up again here, do this, and then go across like that. And once you adjust the line, you get rid of the bits that that aren't um, aren't accurate anymore. So as a as a um, as a result of making these little changes, the drawing becomes more accurate. The lines become more specific. I don't want to get too involved in the eyes because um, <clears throat> they're so. Uh, psychologically important uh, when you're looking at a portrait or when you're looking at a person they can they can uh, fool you into thinking that they're correct even when they're not try to have a big a, a broad view as well you do need to draw details but um, you don't want to go too far with any one area I think it's useful to keep the whole thing going at, at the same uh, at the same rate but there will be times when you um, hone in on an area for a little bit longer than others Okay, now looking again at this shape, um, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about shadow shapes. Um, as you do this, you start to actually see the shadows take on particular shapes. I mentioned before the light shape is kind of like a shark's fin or something, this shark's fin here. Um, then we have this smaller light shape in here, kind of like a... Um, um, 
is it, is it a rhomboid? I don't know, it's, you know, four-sided, irregular uh, shape. Probably something else. Um, bringing that in a little bit more. So there are different modes you can use when you draw. Um, I've talked quite a bit about um, uh, tilts and angles and measuring, but another one is shapes. Okay, and shapes is something that uh, it's kind of happens a bit later in the drawing, but it's really crucial because um, that's what gives the drawing an organic quality, makes it look like it's a it's a natural thing, rather than just a series of uh, you know like a geometric diagram or something. Uh, the shapes can be can be very unique. Well, they are they are very unique to this particular cast in this particular lighting situation. So you can look for light shapes like this, and you can look for shadow shapes like this. You know, this is all one shape. And you want to just be really specific about it. So I tend to alternate between looking at shapes, um, then looking at angles, and measuring. They're probably the three things that I that I do. And I'll spend a bit of time doing each one, and then I'll switch to the other. Then I'll spend a bit of time doing one other, then I'll switch to the other. Um, I often think of it like you're wearing um, you're wearing glasses, and you can flip down the lenses, different lenses, and then you flip up those lenses and try some other lenses and you, your brain actually is processing what you're seeing differently each time. It's all for the same uh, result but you're, um, you're using different faculties. You want as many faculties as you can get when you're drawing because um, we think we know what things look like um, but we don't. <laughs> we don't. We don't really know. We have to look and so Seeing things as they are is the key, not as you think they are. Okay, so just looking for this curve here. That shape. Um, I'm trying not to draw curves really. I'm, I'm drawing a series of straight lines, but they will eventually become curves as I refine them. Taking a vertical line from, from this point, seeing what it lines up with. I feel like mine's too far to the right. So it cuts sort of through the middle of her, her jaw. Yeah, definitely. I've got mine way way too far to the right. You'll often have an intuition about something just doesn't look right, but it doesn't hurt to measure it and check just to get confirmation that, that you were correct. I'm taking another vertical from here down. Uh, that, that lines up with the, the center of the eye. Now, assuming I've got the center of the eye in the right place, I think it's pretty close. I would say, yeah, this is going to line up here, so pushing that across a bit. Yeah, and because I move that across, this can also come in. Yeah, you think drawing faces is hard? Drawing hair is way harder than drawing faces. It's <laughs> even in sculptures, um, it's just uh, it's so unpredictable what it's, what it's going to do. There's no formula for it. There's somewhat of a formula for drawing faces, even though you want to be uh, true to the moment and true to the model. There are things you can expect to happen. Um, yeah, hair is not like that. Okay. So yeah, this, this process, it's just um, further refinement and knowing what my parameters are and remembering where they are and keeping those things fixed 
and then just adjust, adjusting everything uh, within those parameters. One thing I haven't done yet is find a quarter, like a halfway between here and here. And, you know, there's, that's a big open area of, um, you know, her chest. The, the quarter will probably fall somewhere in there, but it's still good to find it because you can take a horizontal line from that and it will line up with something here and here. And it'll help you find where that shadow, um, the cast shadow is as well. So as, again, I'm going to go from the bottom of the drawing, um, guess what the halfway point is, and then double it up. And if it's correct, it will line up with this. I hope that will all happen on the, on the cast. So I'm pretty sure it's going to be below this point. Quite a lot below. Um, there is also this. It'll be somewhere in between the two. The question is whether it's closer to this or closer to this. Um, let's see. Okay, well, um, it surprised me, but it is actually, it does actually line up with this. No, I think mine's too low. If I doubled that, it wouldn't get me there. I'll just show you that. See, so I've got that measurement. I double it up. It only gets me to here. Okay, so this was too low. If I move it to here, and I'll rub out the old line, join that up. If I double that up, gets me a bit closer. That's it there. Now that looks really tall, doesn't it? Part of the reason is because I haven't really made the separation between this light area and the shadow underneath. Because my the point I measured to is actually the very base of the cast. And it, it goes like this. Now this point, taking a vertical line straight up, cuts in through here. Okay. Something like that. Another reason that looks big is because I haven't got in this extra information. Okay, this little shadow, fold of the fabric, um, this. Okay. Starting to look a bit more like it now. And what I'll do is take a, a vertical line from this point, the corner, and see what it lines up with. Because I, I feel confident that these things are close to where they need to be. So if I if I use another guide. Okay, basically on the the right side of the outer the outer wing of the nostril. So something like that. So yeah, that can move further to the left. There are so many ways of getting um, things right. You know, you can measure them or you can look in the mirror and compare. Or you can just kind of look and see, you know, ultimately that's what you want to do. Measuring is just for checking. Uh, or you can use shapes to give you a clue of, you know, that shape isn't, isn't the right shape as that. Maybe that, that bit has to move. Um, many different ways. And um, they're all useful. So um, another thing you can do is... Uh, measure, just measure everything against everything. So you measure this and compare it to see what it lines up with. Okay, so I'm going to do that on, on the, the cast. So I'm going from this point to here, which is the widest point. I'm going to use my longer pencil. This is a white pencil with a pencil extension on it. It's just longer, so I'm going to do that. Take that measurement and then with my arm still straight, start at the bottom and see where the tip of the pencil lines up. Let's see. It lines up just above the wing of this nostril, okay? Which I would say is here. So maybe it lines up here. So I can do that. And it's pretty good, it's pretty good. A little bit narrow, but that's okay. Which side should it grow on? This side or this side? Let's have a look. I'd say probably here. And maybe a little bit here. So 
So hopefully um, you can see that, you know, uh, drawing takes time. <laughs> it's always, always surprises me how long it takes to get something right. And, uh, you know, this has still got, still got quite a way to go. But, um, it's worth getting it right. If you have a good process, then um, you'll be willing to spend more time. There's nothing worse than uh, developing a drawing and putting in the hours and missing some key moments where you should have um, got the proportions right early on and then drawing the detail in but the detail is in the wrong place because the proportions are not right and once you realize the proportions are wrong you either pretend that it doesn't matter and keep going knowing that it will never actually be right or you think, well, I guess I'll have to rub it all out and start again. Neither of those are good solutions. So, so I really recommend learning a good, a good strategy for getting proportions early on in the drawing. And the rest of it, the rest of the process um, allows things to fall into place. Uh, it actually, I wouldn't say it gets easier. Um, <laughs> it, yeah, I guess it gets easier in some ways hard later on but um, it's more rewarding and you actually do get a drawing that looks like um, the thing you're looking at so, um, okay now I'm looking back and forth and really honing in on this shape here um, Now you can see on the cast there's sort of a half tone between here and here. I'm uh, basically ignoring that for the moment. I'm just looking at the shadow shape and the separation between light and shadow. And you can see on the cast, um, shadow, there's a line here. This side is shadow, this side is light. You can cast a shadow. See that? I'm casting a shadow onto the um, cast. And it unites with this shadow, but you can still see it here. That tells you that this, even though it's dark, is not actually shadow. The shadow does start at this point, and that's to do with the angle of the light in relation to the, the round form of the cheek. There is a point where the light actually grazes it, and you're getting a little bit of light still hitting it, and then there's a point where the cheek turns and the light goes past, and that do that part doesn't receive any light. That's technically shadow, and so that's why I'm treating it differently. Because when I draw, I want to keep my shadows really, um, really unified and flat, and I want the light areas to have a gradation going from shadow towards light. That's what gives the illusion of um, three dimensions in a drawing. And filling in shadows is a very boring uh, thing to do, but <laughs> part of drawing. When you feel uh, like you don't want to do any measuring, you can just start filling in shadows a little bit. And again, you decide on the tone that you want the shadow to be. I'm not doing a one-for-one -one match of this cast. Um, that's not the point. The point is to uh, give the give the illusion of the same three-dimensional effect or the three-dimensional reality that the model has um, within the value range that you're using. So you might have a really light shadow, you might have a really dark shadow. I'm using an HB pencil, so it's not going to be that dark. And I'm using a bit of white chalk for the, uh, for the lights, and that's not going to be that light. So it'll be a kind of um, not not as not as intense uh, effect, but the relationship between the dark and the light will be the same relationship that you see on the cast, um, because you've got extremes. You've got extremes there, and you'll have extremes here, and, th and they behave, they interact with each other in the same way. Um, it took a while for me to really to really understand that. Um, that you're not just trying to make this 
look visually exactly like that so that people can't tell the difference. It's not really about that. It's about understanding what the um, what this is as, as a three-dimensional form and replicating that, that illusion here, um, but not, uh, not, not, in a, not in a purely visual way, in, in more of a conceptual way. Hopefully that, that makes sense. It's a little hard to, um, to comprehend if, unless you've um, had the experience doing it, but, um, but it actually is a um, quite freeing way to think about drawing. It's not, you're not just copying. You're interpreting. Okay. <clears throat> so I feel uh, pretty good about where things are placed in a, in a general way. Uh, and now what I need to do is um, Start refining things a little bit more. Start um, making the shapes a little bit more specific and with a, uh, slightly more clear edges. Okay. Because this is in preparation for um, adding light and shade. I noticed that um, this uh, shadow under the eye lid is probably a little bit too um, small, a little bit too short. I'm going to extend it, add a little bit more to it. And at the same time as doing that, I'm also looking at this white shape because those two things rely on each other for their existence. They both need to um, take up the right amount of space. Uh, one way that you can think about this is, um, you know, um, border disputes between countries, right? You've got um, you've got many battles that have happened over the over the centuries between between warring warring countries and warring states. They're fighting for land. It's kind of the same thing, you know. You've got this shape here. It wants to take up a bit more space. This one wants to take up a bit more space. They negotiate. Uh, you can have this little corner here. I'll take this this territory and um, they eventually reach a uh, an agreement and so you can you can treat you know, the whole drawing like that it's all a bunch of um, bunch of shapes that are trying to stake their their ground um, in the space of the drawing so at this stage of the drawing I'm still um, thinking about it um, in, in quite a flat way. <clears throat> like I'm thinking about it in terms of shapes. Um, shapes and uh, angles and things like that. Um, as it progresses, if you keep, you keep working in this way, as the lines become more and more um, specific and more precise, it starts to take on the quality of a, th of a three-dimensional object. It, I've, I've found that that just kind of happens um, over time as you develop the drawing because it is a three-dimensional object and you're paying attention to it and trying to trying to make it look um, like it is and then it starts to emerge like that and so before you even um, put any light and shade on the drawing um, there's still a, there's a stage when you think about it as a three-dimensional thing and that's crucial because um, there are so many things that you can uh, you can pick up on that you wouldn't pick up on if you're just thinking about it as a, as a series of two-dimensional shapes. I think that's important at the beginning of the, of the drawing, but you eventually, you know, move into a three-dimensional understanding as you go. I was just checking where the corner of the mouth is, um, took a vertical in relation to the eye. It seems to be, seems to be about here. And then I also want to look at this space here. Okay. Now, this um, shadow shape, I think, can um, do that. I want 
want to uh, be more specific about the bottom of the nose, exactly where it is. Part of it is in shadow, part of it is uh, not. There's a cast shadow from the nose and then there's also the form shadow. Um, if you squint your eyes they, they look like one shape. But what's really going on is, is that the nose um, turns under and that part is in shadow. Then it casts a shadow onto the upper lip and they appear at the same time because they are both shadow. But you need to draw the contour of the edge of the nose as well within, within that shadow shape. Now when you're drawing the, um, the features, I really like to, um, you know, travel between these points and try and um, see the relationships between all of them because there's so many complicated uh, forms in there and so many complicated angles and shapes. Uh, a, a, good, a good bit of advice I got when I was training was, um, you know, don't, don't draw an eye, draw, draw all the shapes around the eye and the shape that's left over will be the eye. And you could say that same thing about the nose, you draw all these shapes, this shape around the nose and then this will just appear rather than think because um, the, the features um, have so much have so much of a hold on our attention partly because they have names and you know people talk about them and things no one really talks about the this bit this bit no one really even knows what it's called but it's just as important as the nose or the eye so um, I say treat treat everything equally as equally important and uh, everything will come together in the drawing. So I'm starting to um, hone in on the shapes a little bit more, um, clarifying the edges and probably filling in the shadow a little bit more, making it slightly darker. And this, this is really in preparation for, um, you know, adding some light and shade into the, into the, the light part of the form. You can see I'm starting to sort of draw, I'm moving my pencil without actually drawing. I'm trying to travel over the form, feeling it, and feeling where things have to change. shadow on the corner of the eye and I need to define this uh, lower lid it's really catching a lot of light that's one of the lightest parts of the cast I think the the angle of the the plane is really like facing 90 degrees to the light source so that's blasting with light it's very important that I um, acknowledge that that it's there because I haven't really done that yet. Okay. Yeah, that can push down a little bit more as a result of that. And then looking at this, um, yeah, down a little bit too. Looking at the negative space here and here, the shadow underneath the upper lid, I'm 
Okay, I'll check uh, with the mirror as well. Try and get a fresh, um, fresh view of things. Looking pretty good. Um, I think I can create a bit more um, fullness on the cheek there. Um, it's not really something I'm concentrating on right now, but I did notice that this this can change. It can grow out a little bit more. So it's kind of interesting to see um, the drawing is becoming more more specific, a little bit more precise. Uh, but it's the same drawing that that I started at the beginning with those big, thick, loose lines. And they were really the foundation um, for everything that came afterwards. And it's not the only way to draw, but uh, I found it to be a, a really good way to draw. And uh, yeah, don't always think that the drawing you see finished um, started out that way. Uh, <laughs> they, they start out a bit more um, rudimentary and... and Simpler, but um, yeah, they build up over time. It's not a case of adding lots of information, um, it's more a case of moving things around. Okay, so now I'm starting to really think about this, this cheek as a volume. I might even indicate some of the plane changes that are happening. There's definitely one form here and then another form here. And you know, you've got a flatness here and then you've got the chin as you know, it's quite a full form. Doing that makes me think that this can probably go down a little bit. It's just a millimeter or two, but it's it's a fairly small drawing, so that does count. Uh, now, getting a bit more specific about the lower lip and um, exactly where the shadow is. Uh, this cast shadow actually needs to move further to the right. If I take a vertical line straight up, it seems to want to be here. As you can probably um, imagine, this this process can keep can keep going for quite a while. You can keep refining things um, before you even add light and shade. Just adjusting these shapes and uh, starting to think three dimensionally about what you're doing as well um, can be very useful. So I'm I'm moving a little bit away from the two dimensional conception and, and the three dimensional thing is becoming more more dominant in the way I'm. The way I'm thinking. Still a bit of both, but um, it, it is moving in that direction. Yeah, this, this is too high. She looks like she's uh, a little bit angry, so I'll just bring that down a little bit. Um, 
this can go. It's difficult when lines are almost ver almost vertical. I drew that on that angle, but when I look at the cast, it's actually basically purely vertical. It's not always easy to see that. Okay, now looking for this shape. Um, probably starts around here. Goes around like this. And does that. just looking back and forth between the cast and the drawing. Kind of uh, practicing what I want to do before I do it, holding my pencil above the paper just to see if um, I want to make that move or not. And I'm, I'm doing the same thing that I was doing at the beginning. I'm looking at, I'm looking at angles and I'm comparing the angle on here to the angle on my drawing. It's, it's the same thing, I'm just doing it on a much smaller scale because I'm looking at the eyes and the nose. But it's the same, it's the same uh, way of thinking that I had at the beginning. these same things again because there's always a little bit that you that you missed or you just weren't as um, um, nuanced or as specific as as you could be you you know you, you become more uh, more perceptive as the drawing goes on and the lines become more um, more specific I suppose as it develops and you can make make more precise changes. I can come in a little bit more. Maybe not. Maybe it goes out again. <laughs> I'm really feeling my way between here and here, feeling my way between here and here, between here and here, just so I know where to put the line if it needs to change. to finish the whole drawing. I'll spend spend most of the time probably working on the face. And what I can do is take a measurement from the bottom of the chin to the bottom of the nose because I just want to make sure that it's in the right place. I'll double that up. Gets me to here. Okay. Do this. Do that. Pretty close. I can probably come up a tiny bit.
Okay. You've probably noticed that with the kneadable eraser you can um, you can make it into any shape. So if you want to rub out a very thin area, you can squash it like that and get quite a thin, like a blade kind of shape. Um, going to check with the mirror again. It's looking a little short there, but I don't, I don't know why. It's probably the case that this needs to move in. And I'll, yeah, I think it is. Bring that in. So I'm starting to think about taking uh, the drawing to the next stage. Um, this is a slightly shorter demo than uh, the, 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 the amount of time I would spend on on a drawing if I wanted to make it really refined. I'd probably spend um, maybe a couple more hours or so um, developing this stage. <clears throat> but for the sake of um, you know um, this, this course and teaching you guys um, the, uh, the steps that I take when I do a drawing, uh, I'll, I'll start developing the, the light and shade. So um, as I said before, I've been developing uh, shadow shapes and I've been making the distinction between what's shadow and what's not shadow, okay? The shadow is what, you know, technically the shadow is what whatever the, the light source, whatever plane the light source doesn't touch, okay? That will be in shadow because it's turned, it's turned enough away from, from the light source that it, it actually doesn't receive any direct light. It, it might be receiving reflected light like light bouncing from underneath or from, from something else around that's reflected light bouncing back into the shadow. Sometimes you get a light, you can see under here there's a reflected light of the, underneath the chin bouncing from here up. Um, that is there, but it's not as strong as this actual light source which is illuminating these planes which, are, which it's facing. So you want to make a very uh, clear distinction between what's what's reflected light and what's actual light. And uh, when in a drawing, when you're dealing with a uh, limited uh, range of tone, uh, you can't really afford to put in lots of information in the shadows. You need the shadows to be pretty simple um, so that you can spend um, more of your, more of your tones, uh, use, use more of your tones traveling from shadow to light. Okay, so, as I said before, I'm, I'm not going to um, uh, finish the whole drawing, but I'm going to choose a couple of sections and start modeling them. So I'll, I think I'll start with the forehead um, because this part of the forehead is, is very light. If you look at the angle of the light source, there's an area here where it's really facing, you know, to 90 degrees to the actual light like that. So that'll be the lightest part. <clears throat> so I'll get my white chalk. This is uh, called this is General's Charcoal White. It's quite a good brand, General's. If you find it in the art stores, um, very uh, very soft and chalky. I, li I like using that. There are some other whites that are, that are a bit waxy. Um, that is not as not as satisfying to use, I think. So now I'm thinking about light rays hitting this hitting this thing, hitting this form. Okay, so I'm very lightly hatching, putting down marks. And I know that, that this plane here is where most of the light is catching. And so I'm, I'm pressing a bit harder with the pencil there so that I get more, more of the white chalk in that particular part. And then I have to make a decision about where do I stop the white and where do I begin modeling with the graphite. And so what I'll do now is start from the shadow. I'll make the shadow a little bit darker. It gives me a bit more range. It gives me more of, more of an extreme 
to push down to. Okay, so I've got the extreme up here of the white, and I've got the extreme down here of the dark, then I just move between the two. So I'm creating a gradation, traveling up like this, and then letting go. Okay, so I'm creating a gradation along this edge, starting here, moving up, letting go. Okay, and it, it, it's the it's the toned paper in between which creates that transition between between the two. Um, going to articulate that um, a little bit more. Let me see where this is. I'm just clarifying where the shadows are so that I can um, model the form towards the shadow. I need to know exactly where it, where it starts. And uh, this line here indicates that. <clears throat> um, it would be a very boring uh, lesson if you just watch me fill in shadows, but <laughs> that's kind of that's part of the the process. And so I haven't I haven't done a lot of it. Um, I've done enough, I think. But but yeah, if you wanted to you know, really uh, develop a drawing uh, to a high level, you you would um, spend time filling in shadows, making them all. One flat tone. Incidentally, um, you you learn to do this um, by drawing, uh, but when you go to paint, it's a lot quicker to to make a flat shadow because you just mix up the color and, and paint it on. You know, it's much quicker. It's like a reward for having to uh, go through all of those drawing stages to learn how to do it. Um, okay, so I'm traveling from from the shadow up. And just filling in little little gaps in, in the paper to try and um, create a gradual transition. Now this can get darker. So what you're doing is kind of creating a um, a hierarchy in the drawing of where which planes should be um, that tone, which planes should be that tone, which planes should be the tone of the paper, and which planes should be the the white, <clears throat> and uh, I find that a lot of that is is in, I guess it's intuitive. You only really learn to do it by doing it. Um, you can you have an idea, but each drawing is a little bit different. So I'm just lightly indicating some of these uh, uh, plane changes and, and detail in the hair because all of this is lit. It has a lot of light coming on it, so I don't need to go very dark. Um, then I can create a bit more of a transition in here. One more step towards shadow. Just touching it. And then what I'll do is um, travel down and join onto this shadow. Now, it's an interesting thing. Um, this area, or well, this area on the cast, it looks quite li looks quite light because it's surrounded by shadow. But if you actually analyze which direction it's facing, like that plane is actually kind of facing me. It's not facing the light source. So <clears throat> it looks light, and a lot of people would be tempted to use some white chalk. But I know that it isn't. It just isn't. It isn't turned up that way. It's sort of turned this way. And so it must, this must be darker than that, by logic, okay? And, I, and I've made this area this light, and so it makes sense for this area to not have any white chalk. Uh, and then you just, you keep sort of um, adjusting it until it feels like it's, it's existing in the right kind of space. This is almost like um, like sculpting. You're pushing things towards the light, and you're um, well, you're pulling things towards the light, you're pushing things away from the light by either using the white chalk or the pencil.
Okay, now traveling down again to here. There's a bit of shadow uh, in the gap between um, um, the area under the eyebrow and the upper lid. A little shadow there, and then there's another cast shadow underneath the underneath the upper lid. Um, I'm a little reluctant to put a lot of detail in the eyes, but I can um, maybe suggest it like that. Uh, I should do the other one too if I'm doing that. So. The eyes, um, they're not really light, they're not facing the light source, but they're not in shadow either, except a little bit at the bottom here. And as I mentioned before, this, um, this lower lid is really facing the light source, so I'll, I'll get some white chalk and I'll put it on there. <clears throat> you can vary the pressure to get different tones. You don't have to press really hard everywhere with this. In fact, I'd probably recommend pressing lightly to begin with, and then if you need to um, make it, you know, make it lighter, you can, you can press harder. Now here, um, it's, it's facing maybe this way. You know, not, not, not exactly towards the light source, but not into shadow either. And actually it looks quite light. It's getting into shadow as it turns down. So I might leave that as the paper. And then I'll start moving down to create that transition. Kind of creating a little pathway. and making sure the shadow is actually the tone that I want it to be. Okay, now that this is uh, started, I'll continue um, developing it. Traveling from dark towards light and you know you've got your eraser if you need to rub back a bit if you've uh, made it too dark uh, that's you know pretty necessary as well not only a matter of adding dark you can also remove it So hopefully um, you guys understand the, the qualitative difference between shadow and light. Um, you know, it sounds obvious, but um, the parts of the form that are, that are in the light um, that have, have planes that are facing the light source to some degree. You know, the light might be grazing those planes, but they're still, they're still rays hitting them. That's why you get the gradual transition. Once that point occurs where the form turns away, it's no longer, that's no longer happening. It's, uh, it's in shadow. And so I'm keeping the shadows flat. And I'm keeping, I'm making the lights um, gradate gradually towards the light source. And this is not a case of just, um, copying what I'm seeing. I mean, obviously I'm being informed by what I'm seeing, but I'm also trying to understand in a three-dimensional sense what, what this sculpture is and replicating that, um, uh, replicating that form in my drawing. This is an area which is um, turned down more towards away from the light than, than, than even this. So it's getting darker going that way and it's getting darker going that way. So you've got kind of two directions of uh, movement from light to dark. Um, a very useful uh, thing to do is uh, draw, draw a sphere 
Okay, draw, draw a sphere and imagine a light source, or you know, imagine the same light source, um, and then create the transitions between light and shade on that sphere, and then you can uh, relate each part of the each plane on the sphere to somewhere on here. It's it's part of the training you would you would do if you were um, studying in an in an academic um, setting in a you know atelier or something like that. Anything based on, um, you know, um, the French 19th century uh, training or, you know, things that even um, uh, have, it, have their roots earlier in, in the Renaissance. Um, it's, it's that way of thinking. Um, if you read Leonardo's notebooks, he, he talks in depth about spheres and uh, light sources and how the rays of light interact with the sphere and how uh, how you would expect the light effect to appear based on the angle of the light. So th yeah, this is something I, I, I think about a lot in my uh, in my work. I want to. Um, I mean, first of all, it's it's that it's that effect that I that I want to get. That, that something is is believably three dimensional, um, and it's it's the it's the beauty that you get from that effect as well from the, from that process. It's also the connection to the uh, to the history of that of that process. There are a lot of great examples of um, paintings and drawings um, in the museums. And uh, when you when you learn this kind of method, you can look at those paintings and, and really understand what the artist was thinking. It's, it's really great. Now, um, I've only used white chalk in a couple of places. I'm going to try and look for some more opportunities. I think on the nose, uh, certainly, I can use it. I'm kind of doing hatching, and I'm, I'm leaving little bits of paper in between the hatching marks. Um, I don't want to completely obliterate the paper. I mean, not, not in that area, anyway. Um, and then I'm going to spend a little bit of time on that that eye. And I need to clear some ground here for the lower lid because there's too much graphite there. So yeah, I think that's good. We'll do this. Now I'm just wondering if, if I can justify some white chalk here, looking at the angle of the light. Yeah, I think I can just a little bit here. And a little bit here. And then to juxtapose, because there's not much there, the only way that will look light is if this all looks darker. So I'm going to um, start creating some transitions down here. Turning away from the light. Everything is about opposition when you're doing this. Op opposing light, light and dark. Something only looks light if there's something dark um, uh, to create the contrast and vice versa. Now thinking about this shadow uh, down on the chin and traveling, the form traveling up from the shadow like this. So normally when I work, I will choose um, I'll choose a section and, and really really finish it um, com like completely um, understand it. I'm doing it a little bit differently with this, um, partly because I want you to see the, the effect of the, the, the sphere of the, of the face, the sphere of the head. Um, but basically, if you if you choose an area 
to start modeling with um, that has the lightest light and the darkest dark, then you've, you've created an arc which takes into account the full range of tone. Okay? And then what you can do is use that as, a, as an example for the next form that you do. So like that curve, where that plane is facing that way, also relates to this, you know. Um, it doesn't get that light, but this relates to this. So these tones should be the same as each other. I'm going to just um, lose a bit of the, the graphite. I feel like I've gone too dark, considering how um, what the tone of the shadow is. Okay, I'm looking for a couple of moments of um, white chalk in the eye where the, the plane actually just catches a bit of light. Just like that. And there's a moment um, in the upper lid as well which, which turns towards the light. I'm going to um, just place a little bit of white chalk here. And um, I think this turns away enough, away enough that it um, actually can get that dark in this too. Okay. So anyway, this um, this process, although it was um, somewhat. Uh, abbreviated, it actually does cover the steps that I that I use when I do a drawing. Um, I would I would usually probably spend longer, but um, yeah, I've I've covered I've covered the way I work, I think, um, pretty accurately. Um, it's the kind of thing you could just keep working on. Um, when you know what you're doing, you can just um, it usually gets better as you work on it, not not worse. Although that can happen. Um, looking for more transitions. So yeah, in in my mind when I'm doing this, I'm really just thinking about um, the overall effect of of roundness and the light source um, hitting that that round form and then what's happening to the shadow so there you have it i hope you've enjoyed and um, see you next time thank you